an eminent personality psychologist named Daryl Bem. I don't know if you've heard his name, but he, a uh, very prominent guy in the field of psychology, very well respected. Um, but he had spent like 10 years basically uh, in the early 2000s running a series of big experiments on precognition uh, or specifically what he called and what the field calls presentiment. And that's the idea of, of responding or pre-sponding to something that's about to happen, okay, or to some stimulus that's about to occur. And what he did was he put large, he would, he would, these were big studies. He wanted this to be, you know, he wanted to have enough people that there would be statistical significance in these studies. Uh, and they were relatively simple, like paradigms because he wanted other laboratories to be able to replicate these things. But so what he'd, ha he'd do was, was he would put Cornell university undergraduates in these, uh, typical psychology type experiments, but where he'd invert the order of stimulus and response. So in his most famous experiment, he had like a student sit in front of a computer screen and try to guess which of two curtains on the screen had a picture behind it. Okay. Now it was randomly determined after the mouse, after they would make their mouse click, which curtain had the picture. So there wasn't actually already a, uh, a picture behind the, the curtains. But anyway, uh, now you'd think that they would be accurate 50% of the time, mm -hmm. which is exactly what he found when the picture that would be revealed was boring. Okay. Just a boring like beach scene or something like that. Mm -hmm. But when the picture was erotic, okay, they were accurate more than 50%, which meant that somehow, you know, there, there was, there was a reward there and they were responding to that reward by picking the curtain with the erotic picture more than they should have been able to do. Okay. And this, this is mind blowing. You know, like, so they like this, knew that the picture was going to be erotic. They didn't know, but they, they're guessing and, and they think that they're just guessing randomly, but somehow they had, a, they had a hunch that the picture would be behind, you know, one, this, a certain curtain. Okay. Wow. Okay, so that was his most famous finding. And he actually did multiple experiments, variations of these, these things. There was another one um, uh, where he gave students a word list. All right. This was a tip, this is a typical kind of a typical kind of memory experiment. You might give uh, participants a word list and then give them a second like refresher on certain of those words and then test them. Okay. And see which words they remember. All right. Uh, or, or they, they'll try, you'll try to ask them like, well, what are the words that you saw on that list? Mm -hmm. And they would, they would, uh, you know, they'd be more accurate with the words that they got a refresher on, or I'm not saying, or typically it wouldn't be a refresher. They'd had, they do some other kind of task in which they were kind of subliminally primed with certain of those words. And anyway, right. they would, they would pick out those words more, more than they would on the other words. Okay. Well, he reversed that. So he gave the, the, the participants a word list and then he tested them on, you know, he said, now, can you please tell me the words you saw on that list that we showed you, you know, a half hour ago or whatever. And then after the test, he would gave them a refresher on certain of those words. And again, they did better on the words that they got the refresher on later. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he called this re retroactive facilitation of recall as the word that he used for this. Anyway, so he took a lot of basic psychology paradigms, but just flipped them in that way. And he got statistically significant results in, I think, eight of the nine experiments. Um, so this was like, like what, again, what the fuck is going on here? Um, so, you know, he, he submitted this to a, a, a major, a major journal and the, and it went through peer review the peer, you know, peer review could not find a problem with it, but the editors like attached a note, like saying, you know, we can't, we, we have a responsibility to publish this because it went through peer review, but we can't like, we can't explain this. It goes against all of our beliefs and so on. So they even had to like 
attach a disclaimer essentially to this article. Wow. All right. Uh, anyway, this this it's where it's, was it was it published on a, in a journal or something? Yeah, uh, the journal of. I'm I'm forgetting the name of the journal. It's like one of the top ranked journals. Really? In, Is it in like CBI? How, how could we search it? Just type in uh, "feeling the future." Feeling the future. Yeah, Daryl Bem, B-E-M is his okay. uh, his last name. Feeling the future. It's very famous now. Okay. And uh, and of course, there's like a million people trying to debunk it. You know, if you go on Wikipedia, yeah. there it's like you know there's there are cadres of people who just debunk. There you go. You know, controversial the future. experimental right. evidence for anomalous retroactive influences on cognition and effect. Wow. I have something else here that's like it's like a Oh, this is him, Daryl. This is uh the same Yeah. It's like this well, is a list of a whole bunch of like top like ninety articles and, and Daryl's is one of them. What was the year again that it was published? This is twenty twenty eleven. Twenty eleven. And okay. then he subsequently uh with some colleagues uh published a kind of meta analysis of a bunch of other laboratories that then re who who had rep mostly replicated his findings. So like mm -hmm. uh, something, something like 80 or 90 separate replications, most of which got the results he got. Mm. Um, uh, and anyway, so, you know, this is just one corner of the topic of, of precognition that I, I have since immersed myself in for the last decade and a half. Um, have there been any other studies done since then? Yeah, there's a a lot. A lot of people are doing this work around the world. Not a, no, I won't say a lot. Mm -hmm. Some people have. There are um, uh, a few handful of, of researchers in neuroscience that are mm -hmm. open minded enough to, to study this stuff. But no one can get the funding necessarily to do to that's necessary to do right. to do you know a big major study on this because right. because you know no one at in in the big funding institutes are, are going to like take take it seriously at this right, point because right. there's so much uh so much resistance to this topic like you know you find that with any paranormal topic you know we're I, I think things i hope things are going to change uh because i think honestly i think the way the ufo topic has opened up in the last few years i think this may help some of these other topics now i honestly have come to believe that there's no intrinsic connection between ufos and uh uh, uh, you know, ESP necessarily, mm -hmm. but, uh, the fact that all these things are sort of stigmatized in the same way and kind of get lumped together under the cat heading of the paranormal, uh, you know, helps. I think the, what's happening in the UFO scene right now, will hopefully will kind of help right. move, uh, move things in the, um, in the, in the realm of ESP research. <laughs>